Okay, continuing on with our uh, discussion of poetic key terms, uh, we can think about personification, which is the giving of human characteristics to non-human things or abstractions. So we'll find this a lot in uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, where elements of nature, the sun, the moon, uh, other forces of nature, are given human characteristics or uh, they are sort of personifications of a human-like personality. And we see this as an example here, a funny example from SpongeBob where the sun is clearly a personification, right? It's given human characteristics. Another uh, key term would be an illusion. And this is a uh, a type of reference that exists within a piece of literature to another piece of literature. So it's a direct comparison of the text that you're reading uh, will make reference to another text. So usually you'll find uh, historical references. So maybe it'll there's there'll be some reference to uh, the past to something that occurred in the past to a literary event or character. So they might mention uh, character. Uh, often Greek myth is a big one for poetry, so there might be an, an allusion to a Greek myth or a biblical reference. So that's why it's sort of good to be well read to pick up on these little allusions, but again most of the, most of the time we can sort of uh, identify names or events that sort of trigger um, something that we've heard of before. So that's where we can sort of find allusions. So when we're talking about poetry, it is important to understand that a poem is meant to be read, but it's also sort of uh, important to, to know what the poem looks like uh, on the page. So we talk about, as English students, we talk about form and content, uh, form and sound, uh, also sort of these ideas are sort of uh, very much evident in uh, poetry. So that's why it's important to sort of read it out loud, look at the words as they are laid out on the page, and then note uh, what words are being emphasized by the speaker. So we can appreciate poetry more when we understand that uh, the form, so how it is structured, is also related to the content, so what the poem's about. Oftentimes you'll get sort of um, the mood of the speaker will be sort of uh, kept in the line sequence. So if there's four lines, a quatrain, uh, that might sort of represent one single uh, mood of the speaker, and then the next quatrain will have a shift of perspective or shift of mood or attitude of the speaker. So form and form and sound and form and content are all sort of part of this discussion. So these are some common uh, structures that we can look at. Uh, free verse is when there is no consistent metrical pattern. And we talk about meter. Uh, I'm not going to get you to read or scan for meter, uh, but it is good to know that um, in poetry, there is sort of set patterns of meter, which is the stressed and unstressed syllables. And I don't know if you've done that in high school, but marking stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, and identifying it as iambic pentameter or whatever, uh, whatever sort of meter it is. I'm not going to make you do that for this poetry unit, but uh, it is sort of uh, important to note um, which words are being emphasized, so that sort of gives us a hint uh, of meter as well. So free verse or blank verse is one type of uh, poem where there is uh, unrhymed lines. So there is no sort of rhyme scheme present uh, that you can sort of distinguish off the surface of your reading. And uh, again, this is sort of it often sort of mimics just the natural rhythm of the spoken voice. So there is no sort of forced rhyme scheme in a free verse poem. 
we can also look at uh, rhymed poems. So when we talk about uh, rhyming poems, we think of them as a sort of rhyme scheme or pattern. And you'll find rhyme at the ends of each line. And it can come, your sort of rhyme schemes can be sort of uh, structured or organized in different ways. If you have two lines following uh, from one another that are both rhyming, uh, you have a couplet. So the example there is a poem called Captive, and this poet uses uh, rhyme, or rhyming couplets to uh, structure her poem. So for example, we have, once I dive into these pages, I may not come out for ages. Books have power over me. Inside a book, I am not free. I am a prisoner in the land of print on paper in my hand. But do not worry, do not fear, I am a happy ca captive here. So these are rhyming couplets, the final words of each of the two lines uh, are rhyming, so pages and ages, me and free, land, hand, fear, here. So these are our rhyming couplets. Uh, you might have quatrains that have a sort of A, B, A, B rhyme scheme, so this, the first and third line will rhyme, and then the second and fourth line will rhyme. So uh, we'll do an example of sort of how to pick out and pattern uh, a rhyme scheme of a poem. But it's something to think about as well and just have those uh, terms or be familiar with those. Uh, so when you're looking at a piece of poetry, you're going to read it out loud for sure, but you're also going to look at it on the page and identify any sort of breaks or blocks of uh, text. And if you have sort of a clear, clearly marked out um, groups of text. These are called stanzas, uh, not paragraphs. So we are talking about poetic poem stanzas. And they can be formed so you can count the lines. So is it a four line stanza? Then it's a quatrain. If it's a five line stanza, it's a quintet. If it's a six line stanza, that's a sestet. So uh, it is, there's sort of special words, again, used to describe each type of stanza, uh, how many lines there are. Um, couplets is the other one, so for two lines. So again, you can, you can uh, look up uh, what each of those are called. If it's a sort of uh, eight lines, they all have sort of special names. And then uh, you can also, there's sort of the sound of the poem will become important as well. So once you read it out loud, you'll note the rhyme scheme almost immediately, but then you can sort of look more deeply into uh, other types of sound that have become important for an author. So assonance and alliteration. So alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds. And assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds. Um, so you can distinguish between these two types of, uh, of sound in a poem. Okay, so we're going to look at an example of a poem and I'll do a little bit of explanation of how we can sort of interpret or talk about uh, a poem like this one. So our author is Robbie Burns. His dates are 1759 to 1796. And he is a Scottish poet. So he's best known for uh, representing uh, Scottish culture in his poems. And he's very much influenced and draws from Scottish folk tales and legends. And he wants to sort of preserve Scottish identity and when you're reading, you can sort of see uh, some of the dialect, the Scottish dialect, represented in his choice of language, his words, and even the spellings. We'll notice uh, the spellings are different than sort of standard English. So he's representing the sort of spoken, colloquial Scottish dialect when he is uh, writing this love ballad. Um, so this is an example of a of the male tradition, uh, the tradition of love songs, and here our speaker is addressing uh, female love interest 
who he's expressing his love to. So that's our speaker is a male um, that we can distinguish from Robbie Burns. It's not Robbie Burns, it's a persona or speaker that he creates uh, who is addressing a woman that he's trying to court or woo or express his love towards. Okay, so I thought we could listen to it in the traditional Scottish uh, dialect. So I found a clip of uh, an, a Scottish actor reading Robbie Burns' poem. So that's what we'll listen to. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till a' the seas gang dry. Till a' the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee weel, my only love, and fare thee weel a while. And I will come again, my love, though it were 10,000 miles. Okay, so if we are going to explicate this poem, uh, we've heard it. We might want to read it over and over again to get a sort of sense of uh, rhyme scheme and patterns and sound. But we can sort of look at and identify uh, the structure of the poem based on how it looks. So it's divided into four, and each of these blocks are four lines. So we can say that it is... Uh, four, one, two, three, four quatrains. So quatrains are four line stanzas. And then we might look at a uh, rhyme scheme. So uh, our lines, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So we know June and tune are rhymed. So we mark those. Uh, as the following, so our pattern is A, B, C, it doesn't go A again because A and C lines 1 and 3 do not rhyme so we need a new letter, uh, but line 2 and 4 do rhyme so we use the same letter, so A, B, C, B, and then when you start up with your next stanza you would uh, move on in the alphabet. And so we can sort of pattern out our rhyme scheme as the following. So A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E. And then we have the rhyme scheme sort of changing, uh, three and four. We have the same words uh, in repetition. So our uh, rhyme scheme changes a little bit. So till, till all the seas gone dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. So dear and dear, we can put those at the same. So F, G, F, G, and then H, I, H, I. So it has a standard rhyme scheme that we can distinguish. Other sort of interesting things that we can pick, point out, uh, you can say alliteration. So red, red, rose is uh, an example of alliteration, so repetition of that consonant sound, R. Um, you can sort of uh, pick out some other ones as well. We also have two examples of similes, so that word like there uh, is a sort of giveaway that this is a simile, um, figurative language. So my love is like a red, red rose, and my love is like uh, the melody that is sweetly played. So both of these things are uh, ways that the speaker is describing his love for his lady. And then we might think of the symbolism. So red, red rose, what does that traditionally symbolize? How is the rose being sort of uh, used within this poem? The color red is also an important one uh, is sort of all the symbolic associations that come along with that. Uh, 